I did want to acknowledge um, some special guests that came tonight. We have um, Susan Damari from the Lowell Five is here. She, they're one of our donors this year. I'm going to let you know kind of all the exciting stuff that are, that's going on in the fall. But Susan's here from the Lowell Five. We also um, have a lot of school presence. I really appreciate Mr. Ferriero from the North, Mr. Apolloni from the Beltwell and Shawshine, Mr. Fredette from the Shawshine, who's having the caffeine fix problem. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> McMinimum from the Middle School. Um, Mr. Shaw from the West, Mr. Sanderson from Woburn Street in Wildwood, um, and we also have Peggy Kane, who's the, the chairwoman of the school committee, and Steve Higgins from the school committee with us. So we're really excited um, to have you all here and, and to, to witness this with us. Um, tonight, before again, before we begin with the fun for teachers, I just wanted to let you know what's been going on with the Ed Foundation over the last few months. We have a lot of exciting um, grants that we've been receiving. We actually just found out we received a $7,000 grant from Danvers Bank. And um, unfortunately, Bonnie DiOrio and Bob Esdale and Peter McGinn is here. They worked so hard on the paperwork process and the grant process to get that for us. And, and it's really great. We're hoping, we're still looking um, at the gifted and talented programs that we're going to apply it to, but we're really excited about that. We also just received from the Staples Foundation from learning, for Learning an $1,800 grant. And that was thanks to Chris Diorio, who's Bonnie Diorio's husband, who's on the board. Um, we just wrapped up this year's safety book, and we, we had uh, many return donors, which we were excited about, and that will be hitting the school soon. Um, we wanted to also thank, we have two programs going on right now from local businesses. I'm from Lowell 5. They've actually donated the water bottles that are going to be used at the, the Walk for WEF that's happening on October 30th that every student is going to receive. And they're also running a promotion out of their Wilmington branch right now for every new checking account that opens um, between the beginning of the promotion and October 31st. They're going to be donating $25 to the Wilmington Ed Foundation. So we're really appreciative of that support. Um, and the Academy of Traditional Karate, which is a local karate dojo in Wilmington, is offering a fall program to our students where the, pro the entire proceeds from their enrollment fee is going to come back to the Wilmington Educational Foundation. So we have a lot of exciting activity going on right now. Um, and again, it's great to talk about it on a night like this because now we're going to hear from three teachers who benefited from our, our grant process. Um, tonight we have the three teachers who are the 2009 Fund for Teacher recipients. They are Sharon Tenner, who's the fourth grade teacher, uh, fourth grade teacher from North Intermediate. She's going to talk to us about her trip to Africa. We also have Kevin Elone. Did I say your last name right? Okay, <laughs> who's the first grade teacher from Shawshine, who went on a three-week program, uh, Education in Ireland program, and we have Nancy Iorio, who is a second grade teacher from Shawshine, who actually previewed the Winter Olympics in Vancouver and Whistler this, this summer, so it's really great, and without further ado, because I don't like the sound of my voice most of the time, <laughs> we're going to ask Ms. Tanner to, to come on up and, and present her uh, experience for us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharon Tanner, I'm from the North, fourth grade. Um, I just wanted to say before I get into the, the trip presentation how grateful I am to have received the support to go on this trip because it was truly the trip of a lifetime. Um, I have some maps around if you want to see the route that I took. Um, it was a six week overland journey that I did um, and we did cover a lot of ground so I tried my best to kind of add in some points of interest. The last one being um, the site of the robbery, which I have to kind of start with that, and that halfway through the trip I got robbed of all my stuff. So um, I have to kind of thank my trip mates for sharing photos with that with me, because um, I lost all my photos and my cameras um, from the beginning of the trip. So the second half I was able to borrow a camera and piece together pictures, but. It might have actually come up better. <laughs> the best of everybody's um, so I started in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and the beginning of my trip, which I don't have pictures of this part, I was actually able to go back um, to visit a homestay family that I stayed with 20 years ago as a college student in Nairobi. And the, the girl of the family was 15 when I lived with them, and now she's 35 with kids of her own and a real yuppie in Nairobi and it was really exciting so it was really neat to start the trip that way. Um, so it started in Kenya and 
um, I went on an overland truck tour, which is a pretty common thing to do from people from Europe and Australia and New Zealand. It's not so common for Americans to do it. Um, it was a big, uh, company based in the UK called Oasis Overland. So we had 24 people in the truck from six different continents from all over the world, all different ages. Um, we would spend most days driving, seeing sights along the way, and we would camp every night. Um, and we would have cook groups, three or four people in a group that would cook meals for the rest of the group on a rotating basis. Um, and it was just beautiful. Everywhere we went, there was little kids screaming and laughing and yelling out to us on the side of the road. We were quite a, quite a sight to see. So this was the truck. Um, uh, we don't call it a bus. We would get reprimanded if we called it a bus. <laughs> um, all the cook gear is underneath, stored underneath, as well as the you know, tents and, and all our bags. And that's the group. Um, the weather was beautiful. We had um, great weather, no breakdowns, even over really rough terrain. Um, so that was the, the group of us. So it was kind of seats that faced inward on the truck. Um, this is us setting up camp, cooking dinner. Um, the front part of the truck also had kind of this sunroof part where you could stick your head out and look out onto the, the wildlife and all the people um, as you drove by, which was really fun. Um, this was other things of being on the truck. We had to collect firewood for camp fires every night. Um, little children just laughing and smiling everywhere. My, my tent mate who I shared a tent with was named Julie. She was from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, we saw tons of wildlife. We went to several different game reserves. Um, we went to the Ngorogoro Crater in Tanzania and the Serengeti, which I would say were the two of the biggest highlights of the trip. We saw pretty much any African animal that you can name, we saw them, and in huge numbers and very up close, um, which was really exciting for me. And, and I really look forward to sharing that with the kids and the students, because I think they're just, kids are naturally drawn to animals. So these were some of the animals that we saw. Um, water buffalo, giraffe, ostrich, little Thompson's gazelles kissing. Um, this was, the bottom right is the crown crane, which is the um, national bird of Tanzania. We saw lots of lions and wildebeest, um, monkeys, hippos, zebras, all mixed together. It was just amazing and fantastic. We had great local guides. Um, these monkeys were very mischievous. You had to roll up all your windows or they would get in and steal your finch. Um, lions, uh, that was the one cheetah that we saw. Um, we just couldn't believe how up close you could get to most of these animals. We also were able to go to a private dream reserve where we could actually walk with lions that they were trying to rehabilitate. Um, the lion population in Africa is drastically decreasing in numbers, which I was not aware of, um, but they're heading toward being endangered. So this place is trying to breed them and reintroduce them back into the wild. So we were able to hold little baby cubs. That cub is 10 days old and, and actually walk with lions and touch them. And that's something I never thought I would be able to do in my life. Um, we, were, we saw so much African culture. We visited villages, um, a local elementary school, hospitals. Um, we saw the great Zimbabwe ruins, which were the ruins of an old ancient kingdom. King there had over 200 wives. I don't know how I managed that. <laughs> um, we saw, saw lots of capital cities as well that seemed to really be thriving. Nairobi, Kenya, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. We went to Lilongwe in Malawi and Harare in Zimbabwe. Um, we also went out to the coast of Tanzania and went out to the island of Zanzibar where we were able to do some scuba diving um, and see the Muslim history there. Um, we, one of the newest things was that we went to an elementary school in Malawi. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. There was 1,200 students in this one school with 17 teachers only, and over 100 kids per class. So, you know, when we talk about class size here, you know, I think, oh, we're lucky here. But yeah, and the kids were just so enthusiastic and, and curious. Um, I actually got to meet another fellow fourth grade teacher who worked there. 
um, the principal and all the staff, and they were just begging us for help. It was actually very sad. Um, they just have so little, so little resources there. Um, I asked them what their biggest problem was, or their biggest challenge, and they said that they have no toilets for 1,200 kids. So these are kids that they have them <coughs> building, digging pit toilets, and they put up these reeds. Um, so they have five of those for 1,200 kids. Um, this is a typical classroom, which was you know, just shocking to me. Nothing there, no chairs, no desks. They had no running water, no electricity. And the principal asked me for, to give them laptops. <laughs> and all I could think of is, what are you going to do with a laptop? You know, I mean, but, uh, so it was really just a stark contrast when I, when I look around a library like this and just see the, the vast um, you know, disparity in, in wealth around the world. Um, but the children and the people there were just so friendly and welcoming. Everywhere we went, friendly people. Um, so I'm hoping that I can do some kind of um, connection with this fourth grade teacher who I met there and maybe write letters or something. I mean, the kids knew some rudimentary basic English, but, or maybe some kind of thing where I could send some supplies over to them or something. Um, this was on the shores of Lake Malawi. Um, we were able to tour through a village, visit the local witch doctor, who predicted my future. Um, <laughs> and I was really excited, and then I, I, everybody else on the trip went to him too, and he told everybody the same thing. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, this is a local watering hole, a local bar, um, cassava root, that, which is the main staple that they eat there, and um, just lots of interesting little street markets to wander through. Um, Malawi, this is about where I got all my um, belongings stolen in the middle of the night and when I left the tent to go to the bathroom and a thief was watching and just came in and took all my bags, even though my friend was in the tent sleeping. But, um, but that was interesting too, because I learned about the local police and <laughs> they didn't have a car to come. To come. Uh -huh. So um, that was a bit of a distressing situation. Um, we saw tons of street life off the truck. Um, in Africa, there's just, life is on the side of the road. Um, so there was just always these little markets, people selling things, people would come up to the truck when we were stopped. Um, these are red bananas that are very much similar in taste to yellow bananas. Um, the women there do a lot of the heavy manual labor. Um, you see them carrying huge loads on their head. Um, just markets everywhere. Um, just cute, friendly kids everywhere we went wanting to come up and talk to us. Um, these are the Great Zimbabwe ruins that I talked about. They were, they're, they're similar, they reminded me actually of like the Incan things in Machu Picchu in South America, amazing stonework. Um, so we toured around there one day. Um, the landscapes were absolutely stunning. Um, savannas and amazing sunsets. We had one hour of rain in the whole trip, which was amazing when you think of what was happening here with weather. At that time, it was totally raining here. Um, we just, we passed by Mount Kilimanjaro there. Um, this was the, the Ngorogoro crater with, in the dawn. We went down from the rim of the crater with these huge um, banks of fog. It was just gorgeous there. Um, this is Tanzania and a little bit into Zimbabwe. Um, the coast was stunning. Um, this is out on Zanzibar Island off the coast of Tanzania. They have really good scuba diving there, so we were able to do that. Um, and there was a lot of adventure on the trip. The adventure activities were a big part of it, so we were able to scuba dive um, in the Indian Ocean as well as go freshwater diving in Lake Malawi. This was a first for me. We um, saw so tons of animals on game drives, um, canoeing and horseback riding. And uh, I ended the trip at Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. The rest of the group, most of the rest of the group, continued onward. Um, everybody there said, wow, you're doing a short trip of six weeks. And <laughs> everyone here said, wow, you're doing a long trip of six weeks. But they went, you know, for three, two more months, I guess, up just into mid-September. They went down beyond through into Botswana and Namibia and 
South Africa. So my last day and place was Victoria Falls, which is just incredible. It's 200 foot gorge um, where you can do all kinds of adventure activities. This was on horseback viewing game, which was really exciting because you get very close. The animals aren't scared of you when you're on horseback for some odd reason, so you can get really close to them. Um, this is again the game park where we were able to be with lions. This is my lion whisperer photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was really exciting. These are about 10 month old cubs. Um, and so they're kind of training them to walk out in the wild and to get used to actually hunting for game in the park. Um, we got to spend time with some elephants as well and feed them in their trunks, which were very prickly. <laughs> it's not the most comfortable there. And then this was the last day doing adrenaline, um, adrenaline activities in the gorge. Um, this is similar to a bungee jump, but we leapt off, it's called a gorge swing, so you leap off 200 feet and you're free falling and it doesn't feel like you're attached to anything. Um, and you just fall down and you just kind of swing mm. back and forth in the gorge. It was the scariest thing I've ever done. I don't know why I did it. <laughs> but I can say that I did it. Um, but wow. it was really exciting. Um, and this was Victoria Falls saying goodbye to my new friends on the rest of the trip. and. That was an incredible place as well, um, with just huge amounts of water and rainbows everywhere because of the ever-present mist. And there it is. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much Whoa. six weeks in a nutshell. <laughs> so yeah, it was really amazing, just incredible. And just I learned so much just about myself and about the world. And it was really a trip of a lifetime. So I'm just so grateful for the support to mm -hmm. been able to go. Yeah. yeah, two questions. Have we ever uh, felt in danger? No. I, I, I've done a lot of traveling, so I would say I'm pretty confident overseas, but I really, um, it was a pretty safe trip in that we were on the truck, we were in a big group most of the time, but even when I was, when I would venture off by myself or with one friend, people were really, really friendly. Yeah. I no, mean, I did feel unsafe when I got all my stuff stolen, yeah, but that was, I think, an exception. Yeah. The other question is, what are the expectations for these kids in terms of their lives? Are they going to be farmers? Um, you know, it's tough. I think a lot of them are expected to stay home and get money for the family because these their parents are in dire poverty. Um, I think they're happy if they can get through elementary school. You know, a lot of them don't go to high school. And ironically, a lot of them have to pay school fees for, for uniforms you know, the poorest of the four kids, and they have to pay for public schooling. Um, you know, they have regional high schools, and I, I don't think college is really in their sights, but I think, you know, they're, they're certainly doing their best with what they've got, but it's just very, very little. You know, AIDS was really rampant there, and but they did say that AIDS is um, on the decrease, which was nice to hear, but. Um, I'm curious yeah. about the principal's response about the laptop. Did she, did she or he explain why? That I, was I think he just, you know, they were looking at us as white foreigners and, you know, just mm -hmm. whatever you can give us. I mean, I think in his mind, that's, you know, advanced Western things, but I don't know that he understands all that you would need to make that a functional, useful item, you know, for them. Um, I mean, I, I was, I'm thinking more like chairs and desks and, you know, books, books, pencils, the basics. You know, I think that's where they need to start. But, I mean, certain toilets, you know, I mean, that would be, you know, it's, it was just shocking. I, I'd, never, I'd never seen a school up that, that close in such conditions, but I think it's pretty typical. And I think a lot of the governments there don't, you know, the money doesn't trickle down to the people who need it. When you had your belongings stolen, was your passport part of that? Luckily, luckily, my passport and all my money and credit cards, they had a safe under the floor of the truck. So that, that was one thing that I felt very secure about. They always said, just keep all of that stuff under the truck. And we only, there would be two people on the truck that would have two separate keys. So we would just have certain times of the day when we'd close up the truck and we'd get, you know, at border crossings or things like that. So the most important things 
were luckily safe, and pretty much everything else was replaceable. I was also lucky that I had just put in some laundry to a laundry lady to get washed, so I did have some clothes to wear, but, you know, it was funny, because the thief ran, and, and no, none of them have cars, you know, so he ran, and there was some of my belongings scattered along the sand, you know, we could see exactly the trail, the trail. Yeah. Yeah. so, you know, I don't know what he's going to do with my digital camera, but, I mean, you know, it's like he doesn't, he'll probably sell it on the black market. But that's an indication of the desperation. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it turns out that he, well, I, when I talked to the security guards who were sleeping, I had to wake them up. Because it was a very enclosed camp, too. You know, was, we weren't out in the bush. We were, you know, there was people working there. And they, I said, do you know who this could have been? And they said, yeah, we think it was a guy who was a security here, guard here, and he had been fired for trying to rob somebody before. So he knew, you know, he knew the areas that could get in and out, yeah. Well, good for you for recovering from it. Really. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, these things happen, right? So yeah. They need it more than I do, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, what, what part of your instruction or curriculum do you think will be most enriched by your um, trip? Well, right now in reading, we're doing the theme journeys. <laughs> so, you know, I, I tell them stories. I tell my students stories, not only from this trip, but I've I've lived overseas, I taught in Japan for a couple of years, so I bring in stories from overseas all the time, and my former students and parents tell me that that's really memorable for them, so I think I just want to inspire kids to see, see the world, you know, there's so much out there, and it's really so much easier than you think. Um, people think it costs a lot of money or it takes a lot of bravery, but there's a lot of people out there doing, doing what I'm doing. Um, so I, you know, I think I'd like to also help them like with mapping and things like that. I was talking to them the other day and there's, they need work <laughs> in terms of geography, in terms of where, knowing where things are, knowing what's a country, what's a state, what's a city, you know. I mean, they hear names, but just to get maps in their head, I think is really important. So those are some of the connections I'd like to make. So. <coughs> And uh, my project was to preview the uh, upcoming Olympic Games that are going to be in February and the Paralympics in March in Vancouver and British Columbia. It's actually the 21st uh, Winter Olympics, uh, the motto of which is with glowing hearts. Uh, this is the symbol of uh, the Olympics. Um, the symbol is actually the Inukshuk. And the Inukshuk, um, they incorporated the colors of the Olympic rings, which are the five regions of the world, the Americas, um, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania, which is Australia, and the Pacific Islands. And the Inukshuk is an ancient symbol that is uh, found all over northern Canada. This was one shot that I took. And this was right at Stanley Park in Vancouver. But these are found all over northern Canada. So I thought it was really clever how, I was wondering why they had chosen the Inukshuk as the symbol. So these are the mascots of the Olympic Games. Sumi is actually, um, the uh, mascot for the Paralympics, which are the Olympics that are going to follow in March for uh, handicapped athletes. Kwachi and Miga. These are all mythological characters from, um, from Northern Ca um, Canada, Canadian um, mythology. So my husband and I left um, Boston on Friday, July 10th. We flew Air Canada. And this is the route that we took from Boston. We took a flight to Toronto, about two hours, and then on to uh, Vancouver, another four hours. It's about 2,500 miles to Vancouver, about a six hour total plane trip. Long, long day. <laughs> this was the um, shot that we got as we landed. I handed it to a teenager. I handed my digital camera to the teenager, who was a bit annoying during the flight. As well they can be. <laughs> the only time he was quiet during the whole flight, and he took this picture for me. 
And I was really um, taken by the, um, the art, even in the airport, that I wanted to share with my students. As we believe in the airport, the enormous Olympic rings were greeting us. It was pretty exciting. So the reason we went to the University of British Columbia was my husband Ron had a scientific meeting there in Vancouver. And I thought it was the perfect opportunity um, while he was at his sessions to find out about the upcoming Olympic Games in Vancouver. The University of British Columbia is enormous. There are 45,000 students there. It is a city unto itself. So just navigating around the campus was a challenge. This was a shot that I got actually on the back side of the campus. It, it's breathtakingly beautiful. So back to why um, the Olympics were chosen to be in Vancouver. Um, surprisingly, the climate there is very mild, even in February. It rarely snows, but it does in the mountains. So, um, but this was a shot of downtown Vancouver and the Coast Mountains in the background. Another shot I took. <coughs> the um, Olympic flag um, flies years before the Olympics start. So, at least three to four years it flies. So, of course we went to City Hall. And we took 15 shots just to get the wind blowing <laughs> in that direction. <laughs> One of the ex up upcoming um, things that I'm very excited about to share with my second graders is, is on Thursday, the Olympic flame is actually going to be lit in Athens, Greece, and it's going to travel around Athens. And next thurs Thursday, October 30th, um, it will arrive in Victoria, British Columbia. It is going to travel around all the provinces of Canada and end back in Vancouver on February 12th. And I'm hoping to follow it online with the children as an interactive site. So each day we can find out where the torch is being carried. You do not have to be an athlete to carry the Olympic torch. So it's going to go through thousands and thousands of miles throughout Canada so that all the little towns, um, it's going to start at Victoria, go all around and back to Vancouver. So these are some pictures that I downloaded of the Olympic flame. And just try to imagine February 12th, that torch is going to be carried into BC Place. This is where the opening and closing ceremonies are going to be. We'll all be watching it on television. Um, BC Place is one of the um, largest air-supported stadiums. And it's the first time in Olympic history that the um, torch is going to be lit indoors. So these are some shots that I got. This is the Olympic Village um, in Vancouver. There are going to be two Olympic Villages. So it's act it was actually in July, a construction site. And I stopped one of the construction workers, my husband will attest to this, and I said to them, do you think you're going to be ready? I'm thinking, you have known this for years. He said to me, I assure you, they are finished inside but not outside. And then he said, we know they will be finished in October, so hopefully. And these are lead construction leaders in energy and environmental design and there will be um, apartments in Vancouver. It's uh, called uh, Falls Creek, where they're built. So onto the venues. The first venue that we found was um, ice hockey. This is a jam place where the Vancouver Canucks play. This is actually right across the street from BC Place, but the other venues are scattered throughout the city. Right on campus um, is Thunderbird Arena, the other venue for ice hockey. It was a Monday morning. I got there, saw some people at the entrance, and I asked them, if, I told them why I was there. They let me in. And these are photos that I got inside. This is the rink where the Olympic Games, the hockey games will be held. And it was really airy how quiet it was. I couldn't help 
but think how exciting it must be to be there. Uh, this is Pacific Coliseum. It literally took us two days to find this. It was on the far end of Vancouver, and um, not the nicest section of town. Very removed from downtown Vancouver, and figure skating is going to be held here. Near the um, airport is the Richmond Olympic Oval, where speed skating is going to be held. This venue was breathtakingly beautiful. Unfortunately, I couldn't get into all these venues, but it, it cost millions to build it. This is uh, the Vancouver Olympic Center. We were actually unable to find this. We ran out of time. But this is where curling is going to take place. And uh, curling to me is like um, shuffleboard on ice. <laughs> So an hour north of, of Vancouver, we drove to Cypress Mountains, and this is a shot, um, snowless obviously, <laughs> and this is where freestyle skiing and snowboarding is going to take place. Two hours north of uh, Vancouver on the Sea to Sky Highway is Whistler. It is one of the most beautiful places uh, we've ever been to. Um, it's the number one ski resort in North America. So this is uh, the Athletes Village, the uh, Interpretive Forest Function Junction, and this is the other construction site. Um, this was truly guarded. There was a guard at the gate um, who literally ran out to stop me as I tried to get in. And once I explained why I was there, he said, you can get a, quick, a couple of quick shots but that's about it. So it, it's very closely guarded. So again, this was still under construction. In the village, they're going to have their own medals um, plaza where the athletes in um, Whistler will receive uh, their medals. Obviously, they can't go back to BC Place, which is two hours away. Again, you can see this was a construction site in July. This is a shot of Whistler Mountain. And you can see why they call it Whistler Creek, Creek Side, where the alpine skiing will take place. So we decided to head up Black Hole Mountain, which is the other mountain in Whistler. And to get up about Black Hole Mountain, we took a lift. And a bus called the Mountain Express, up another lift called the Seventh Heaven Express, so you get an idea how high up we were. And at the top of Black Hole Mountain were these teenagers getting ready to snowboard. And it was just amazing. Our kids go to the movies or to the mall, but they go snowboarding on a glacier. So this is at the top of Black Hole Mountain. <coughs> And they were kids. Had to get a shot at the ambulance. <laughs> that was a couple of car, uh, cars ahead of us. More of the glacier. What was the temperature? Um, it, it was cool, I would say maybe um, 50s, 40s. But there were tons of snow. I, I was really glad I brought a jogging suit and sneakers just in case. So this is at the top of Black Hole Mountain. In order to get from the top of Black Hole Mountain and Whistler Mountain, uh, in order to travel from peak to peak, you take this gondola. And this was the most terrifying part of the trip for me. <laughs> I got on that gondola and I did not move. I was frozen. I also have vertigo, so I was definitely afraid of my vertigo going off, which luckily it didn't. And we traveled across. And you can see the snow. This is July. This is July. So at the base of Black Hole Mountain is the Whistler Sliding Center. The people at the sliding center were incredibly helpful when I told them why I was there. Um, and this is where the bobsleigh, the luge, and the skeleton venues are. 
So I thought I'd ham it up a bit for my students so they could see. I wanted to see what it felt like to get in the bobsled. And um, in the foreground is the luge, where you are flat on your back. And then in the background is the skeleton, where you are flat on your stomach. Both of which, no brakes. No brakes. This is the sliding track at the base of the mountain. And they cautioned us that, well, they actually didn't caution us. They told us not to worry that the beers only come out when people leave. This is the track and the scoreboard. And if you can see the grass in the center, that's where the spectators will be during the Olympic Games. And what was truly amazing that it's piped in ammonia that keeps the track frozen, which I, I found amazing. It's very high tech how it is taken care of and maintained. It costs millions. It's, it, the um, handout that I have are the handouts that they gave me um, in Whistler. That's the finish line for the bobsleigh and the skeleton and the luge. And I thought it would be great for the children to see a makeshift podium <laughs> where the athletes stand. <laughs> <laughs> On to Callaghan Valley where Whistler Olympic Park is. This is about an, a half hour south of Whistler. It's actually on the way back to Vancouver. So on our way back to Vancouver, um, we headed to see the Olympic Park. And this is where the Nordic sports are going to be held. The Nordic sports are um, the ski jump, cross country skiing, and the biathlon. This is the lift to the ski jump, which of course we took. And that's the gatehouse where um, the jumps will start. This is my favorite picture. This is the gatehouse. And um, our tour guide explained to us that Caligan Valley was especially chosen because it's nestled between the trees and it shields uh, the jumpers, the ski jumpers, from the wind. And they wanted a location um, nestled between the trees, um, very natural. So we had to walk up all these flights of stairs and across and they uh, kept telling us this is what the Olympians, the Olympic athletes will be doing. And this is the view at the top of the jump. And on the bottom right, right here, oh, that's where the um, judges will be rating their jumps. Get an idea of how high up it is. <laughs> the average of defeat. It was very scary. So inside the gatehouse, this was our tour guide, Sean and he showed us the types of boots that they use, that they're, they're able to bend, see how long the skis are, and the special suits that they wear to protect themselves from the elements and uh, from the wind. That's it from the front. But picture it in the snow, it will look a lot different. This crossed the track for cross country skiing. and they struck off for the shooting practice for the biathlon and the finish line. And when we were there, there were 211 days left. I believe as of today, it's 116. Uh, this were the uh, people at Tourism Whistler. Katie Russert on the left was an incredible help to me. Um, she emailed me, uh, we talked on the phone. She gave us numerous hints of what to look and find in Westlaw. Oh, great mm. I want to thank the Wilmington Educational Foundation for making this trip possible. It truly was incredible. I have so much to share uh, and um, plan with my students. Uh, Joanne Benton, uh, Dr. McGinn for their support of these uh, summer adventure projects. Mr. Apolloni, 
and uh, Mr. Sanderson, who is now the principal of the Woolworth Street School, who from the get-go said to me, go for it, try, because mm -hmm. I asked them, what do you think? And they said, absolutely try. You have nothing to lose. Thank you for your letters of recommendation. Uh, again, Katie Russer at Contouras and Whistler. Tracy Napolitano from AAA in Burlington mm -hmm. mapped everything out. Uh, we did not have a GPS, which if I had to do it over again, I, I would have taken a GPS. It was a lot of work finding the venues. My daughter Lauren, whose digital camera was a tremendous help, uh, she helped me a lot with the uh, presentation, the format of the pictures. And last but not least, my husband Ron, my co-pilot, my <laughs> compass, <laughs> helped me find everything. Thank you. Wow. University of um, Ireland, also known as NUI at Galway, and I had the Education Ireland program, and it's a three-week program from July 1st to the 25th, and just to reintroduce myself again, I'm Kevin Elone, and I'm a grade one teacher at Joshua. Um, what I was going to do is just kind of start off by kind of reviewing what I did for my proposal, and then um, I'll go into what, what I'm starting to bring back to my students, and then special moments in Ireland. Um, so by setting the aspects of the Irish educational system at the NUI um, Galway Education Ireland program, I would be able to learn, experience, and discuss a different educational model from that of the, of the U.S. and also bring back my experiences to my first graders by showing them the world is a map that extends beyond the classroom in town and that children are children all over the world. So this is how I started it. Um, I generally always send a letter to my first graders to introduce myself at the beginning of the year. So um, this year I sent them a postcard, and um, I've already had parents, you know, say to me, you know, it's really special. I thought it was so great that they got a postcard from Ireland. And, and then um, I started to bring up my Ireland trip not too long ago with my students, and um, they said, oh yeah, we got we got a postcard from you. So that they've already had that in their heads. So that was the beginning, um, and they really enjoyed that. And then um, to kind of start off talking about Ireland in the classroom, we just, um, in our theme, um, we just started reading one of our big books um, series is To Be a Kid um, by Maya Jumeirah and John Diabanco. And I've, I've read this story since I've been teaching first grade. And even in my old school, we had the Hope Mission series. I've always read this book. And I just thought it was a great story to talk about different countries and to bring back that aspect that children know children all over the world. So that's what that story does. Um, so that's a student pointing to Ireland. And mm -hmm. then really that story. So that's how we start off. And then later on in um, the year, I think it's theme three, we have the um, story Me on the Map. And that's the book that I really talked about in my proposal. It's because it starts small, the little child pointing to where their, their little room is and goes to this town, and the city, and the state, and the country, and then the world. So it gets really big. Um, so we will be starting that. I haven't read that story yet. So that's the second story that will, um, I'll be showing them a globe and a map, and kind of giving them a, a reference point to where they are and where Ireland is. And then, I did this last year. Um, it was so much fun. Um, it's, you know, are you familiar with Google Earth? where you can go and you can just you have a satellite and then you just type in the address and you fly down. I did it last year on my little computer screen. I had a smaller class, so I had all the kids right behind my desk to see it. And we would, you know, put in, you know, Shashi Ave, and they would fly down to to the school. And they thought it was the funniest, funnest thing ever. So um, they really enjoyed that. So we're going to do it again this year, but this time I have an Eber key, so I'm able to plug the, um, my computer into my TV screen, so they'll be able to see it on the TV screen, which I think will be a lot better. Mm -hmm. And my plan is um, to have them sit on the rug like it's a, like they're going on a trip, you know. And I had to make it um, suitable for a six-year-old, so like they're going on an airplane trip, and then we'll fly down to Ireland from where we are. So it kind of gives them that feeling of uh, taking a trip. And then I'll explain to them that you know, an actual plane ride would be obviously a lot longer, kind of like how long their school day is, to give them an idea that I was in a plan for a while. Um, so 
Well, I plan on using that after we read um, Me on the Map, and that's another good connector to how they start really you know, small and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we'll go in backwards to start you know, being both, both small. Um, and then with that, I, I found passports at um, the uh, Learning Tree store, and um, they just look like the regular passport. And my plan is to um, get stickers on Kodak EC Share Gallery. You can have actual stickers of the place that you went, like a, of the picture that you took. So I want to get a picture of the Cliffs of Moore, and then um, everyone gets a sticker so they can get their passports. <laughs> um, and again, I plan on showing all my, most of the pictures that I want to show to them on my TV screen so that they can see that. That's again using Avery P. And so then I said the first half, Cliffs of Moore. Because everyone told me how great the Cliffs of Moore um, is. And that was, that was one of my favorite pictures because it wasn't just the cliffs straight on, it was kind of a different point. And it wasn't raining when I went, so that was really good. <laughs> um, now I'm going to talk about some of the special moments that um, I experienced there. And I was able to um, go to a primary elementary school. Um, it's called the the SCS is in um, Gaelic, and that means something in Gaelic, Bren Moore School in Galway. Um, and we were able to, to visit the teachers, and the teachers were so gracious, and they came from their summer vacations to come in and talk to us, so that was, that was really special. Um, that's the school. And then, again, I just was so blown away by wow. the, um, the Irish people there. The people at the school put up our flag to welcome us, mm -hmm. specifically for us, and I thought that was just really touching and, and special. Um, it, was really, it was really nice. I was able to kind of explore the school. I asked if I could just walk around, and it's very similar, I thought, to, to my school. Um, the classrooms, I don't have a picture of this, but they label things, like I'll label certain things so that they, when they write, they can find the word and write it correctly. And they had it labeled in English as well as, um, yeah. So, because they have to learn, yeah. Like, unless they go to school um, after age 11, say if they're coming from another country, they um, Irish is compulsory. They have to take it. So that that was interesting. Um, this this woman here is Ann Newell, and I thought she was just so sweet and so wonderful. She's a special. She we would say a special education teacher um, at the school at Renmore. And she was going over reading strategies for special needs students, and um, she also used the Orton, um, Orton Gillingham reading. I'm not too familiar with it, but she shared some of that with us. And she gave a couple strategies that kind of really stu stood in my head um, for ch children that hold the pencil too hard and have a too hard of a grip. She says, put on um, a tea towel. She used the word tea towel. <laughs> and then when they and then you put the paper on top and you write, if they go through it, they have a sense of, of how hard that they're pressing into the um, into the um, tea towel in this case. So it kind of gives them that connection in their head. And the other thing that she did, and this is all in her beautiful Irish accents, so everything sounds really wonderful. And she said again, when they have the hard, really strong grip, um, she them to put their pencil down and then to just kind of go soft over their head and feel how soft their hair is and it's kind of soft and gentle and then pick up their pencil so they have that um, connections. So those are two things that I, I, I got from her. Um, she's a passionate, really passionate teacher. Um, and there's a picture. Of and they have the same you know, mural in the background, similar to Shashi. <laughs> <laughs> Someone um, else that was really special is this man here. Um, his name is Mr. Donald Taney. Um, he's a former principal, also an avid photographer, lifelong educator, and he was our official tour guide at 90 um, of oh, our oh, 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 Clonmouth Noise in South Galway and Clare. He went everywhere. I mean, he, we, we picked him up in his little apartment, and he would get on the bus with us, and he would get a microphone, and he would start talking the whole time about <laughs> everything. He knew everything. He was just oh. a really special, special man. Um, and then he would get off the bus, and he would walk with us. I mean, he wouldn't do the whole walking to our part, but he would do a lot of it. And he just knew anything he needed to know. If he had a question, you would ask Donald. He had funny stories, and just a very sweet, sweet man. And um, I got a lot from, from him. And this is us at the um, monastic settlement at Convent Noise. That's me. Um, 
to stay me rest <laughs> from hiking, and I was really hiking. And the day before, I was in Germany also hiking, so I was really sore. Um, but that was the island of Inishbafin, and there's two other islands, um, Inishman and Inishmoor, and um, we had a tour guide for that. We just hiked everywhere. It's really great. Another wonderful part of the Irish that I just I had to point out, we missed the 4th of July. Um, that's when we flew in. I think we flew in the 2nd. And um, so we missed that 4th of July. So on our, our 4th of July, they had a um, 4th of July welcoming party for us, which I thought was really sweet and special with the red, white, and blue um, balloons and everything. This is um, most of our group. Um, teachers from all over the place. Um, mostly from Massachusetts, but um, other parts as well. New York, Rhode Island. One principal as well. An elementary school principal. Jim from Wisconsin. Um, and they're great. Really nice group. Um, and this is my picture with Donald again. Um, we had an end of the year, our end of the culmination three week a program. We had a dinner, and um, he got up and started talking, and I had my camera on, on the video part, so I was able to record him. I wasn't able to put it on my slideshow because it was too dark, but I just listened to what he said, and he said um, the, with these words, may the years um, to come be a sense of joy, happiness, and wonder to you, and when the cold December days come, look back at your photographs, and go back in memory, and think of what we shared together. I just thought that was really sweet. Um, a wonderful, wonderful man. Mm. And then, um, at the very end of our program, the very last day, our director, Mary Surlis, um, who's amazing. E everyone a part of this program was just wonderful, and I couldn't get over how much they planned this program. Um, and she read this poem in Gaelic. I'm not going to read this poem to you. You can read it. It's in front of you. It, was, it sounded more elegant. In, in Gaelic, and I think it has more of the rhyming, but the words, I think, were, you know, very um, touching. And it was written by this man named Seamus, his last name Gaelic, in 1886. Um, he lived from 1886 to 1967 as a school inspector, but his words in this poem are so, um, I mean, they just seem like someone could write that today. That's how I feel about what um, the profession of teaching is. And it was a truly remarkable trip. Um, I took so much from it. And the goal of um, Mary Surlis, the director, after she read this poem, was just really to give us at least one aspect that we can bring back to our classrooms. And I got that and more. Um, so if you care of anyone that ever wants to go to Ireland, <laughs> this program is amazing. I could just go on and on about it. It's just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's it. <laughs> I just wanted to say to all of you, um, you to me have all fulfilled a dream I had when I brought this fund for teacher to the um, foundation. How many years ago was it, Jackie? In, in that, I can see in all of you in your eyes that you have taken, you've grown from what you've done this summer and that I'll always be with you. And regardless of whether you bring this to your classroom, the exact trip, you are, you're bringing something else, and that's sort of the inner, inner piece of you. And, and it's just amazing to me how each experience is so unique, so different, and yet the common bond, you're all teachers. And you truly um, have taught us tonight, and the students are extremely lucky, and we are extremely lucky to have the foundation, because this is exactly why I think the Educational Foundation is so important to mm -hmm. Wilmington. And just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of mm -hmm. us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, when, when, we, were, when we were uh, going through this process, we were only going to award uh, two trips. And we had the three trips, and we said all three trips sound terrific, and, and we can't leave one out. So we took a separate vote, we added a third trip in, and we certainly have been rewarded by it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, as I said at the beginning of all this, this is my favorite night, and I'm sure I speak for a lot of the members here, that 
we all volunteer our time to be on this board, and it's for reasons like this, so that we can see these experiences. And just as a parent, to know that this knowledge is now out there and available to my children is, is wonderful. And even if they're not in your classroom specifically, I know that somehow you're, you're getting this out to them, that your energy um, is contagious to your colleagues. So I really appreciate it. The board really appreciates it. Um, and we thank you so much for coming and presenting tonight mm -hmm. for us.